Talking to Michael Jans of uh, Rich Rath 313. Album came out earlier this month as, as of the recording of this interview. It's still officially August. And the yes. album came out back on August the 6th. LA is mine. I, I'll, I'll start with this straight up because Gary Rich Rath's playing is in this. And, and if anyone knows anything about Rich Rath 313, there's out, it's Gary Rich Rath. Sure. Which songs have Gary Richrath's guitar on it? I was trying to pick that out as I'm like, there's some I'm like, okay, that's clearly him. But which ones, I haven't seen the liner notes yet, which ones have his guitar playing on it? Well, being the expert that you are, I'm sure you figured it out because usually you, you can kind of hear it. Like you said, no, the first uh, the first one that, that we used as, a, as our first single, uh, Help Me Save Me For Myself, that's mm -hmm. all Gary there. It's a Gary written song and, and with my vocals on there. But um, the second one would be L.A. is Mine. And that's the song that Gary wrote in the 70s when he first flew out to Los Angeles. And the third one was one that we we're working on uh, periodically through the years. It's called These Nights. Mm -hmm. Yep, that, okay, sound, now, that sounds yeah. right. Yep, those are the ones. Yeah. I, how would you, as, as someone who, who worked with him very directly, how can you tangibly describe his approach to playing guitar, not necessarily in terms of technique per se, but but you could you could say that, but in a general sense, how would you describe him as a guitarist? Are you there? Yeah, yeah um, still there. The, the, uh, um, he was probably the most underrated guitarist that there is. I mean, he had his own certain style, his own certain sound, but like I said, again, he brought that, he brought his personality through his guitar. And, and he was an amazing person, a man, a, a great friend, but he just, he had that certain special something through his guitar. And I think anybody that was an REO Speedwagon fan could hear that. Um, it, it just came through. I mean, the songs that are the, the iconic REO Speedwagon songs are Gary, you, you can hear it no matter what. I mean, no matter what song that they were playing, you know, and, and I feel so fortunate because through the years that I've, I, I learned from him and played with him, I got that same thing in my songwriting too. So, and the vocal vocal thing is so similar, it's unbelievable. So not only did I get a chance to play with him, but of course, Kevin Cronin, and of course, you know, Terry Luttrell, the original, and Michael Murphy. And, and you know, it, they all the songs, you know, you, you can hear it throughout those time periods. And um, uh, fortunately, I was the last one out of the bunch. So I wanted to keep that approach going because, he just didn't get all the, the credit he deserved, I don't think. Yeah. And um, it's it's very obvious. I mean, you can hear the uh, the, the Gary Richrath REO sound in the songs. And it even carries through on my stuff now, too. But the, I think that the clincher, the people that go out and, and, and get L.A. is mine, the album, Project 313, Richrath Project 313, you know, we've, we redid Riding the Storm Out, and we also redid Son of a Poor Man, back in the, the way that they did it in the 70s. So, I mean, we did the the raw kind of rough rock and roll versions of it. So when you when the people listen to it, they're going to go, wow, that's amazing. And it kind of proves the fact it was Gary. You know, it was all Gary. And, um, and, and it kind of lives through today. Well, and even on Help, help, help Me Save Me From Myself, as soon as the song kicks in, I mean, I... I was like, and I, okay, I'm going to throw in my age here. When when REO Speedwagon was probably at their popular peak, I was two yes. or three. So I mean, when Take It on the Run and Keep sure. on Loving You, and I, I, it's you can you can make different arguments of when were they at their peak. I, that's probably the closest between maybe creative peak and commercial peak when they both kind of coincided right about there. Right. Hearing that song, I went, I do. This is a new song. It feels like it's 1981. Like in a like, wow, this is straight out of original era sure. REO Speedwagon. Sure. Uh, how much, uh, I mean, obviously the guitar solo, and you, as I understand, some of the vocals are, are his, but how much of that was still created today compared to when you were writing, working with him back in the 1990s? Well, I worked with that so song with him several times, but when, <clears throat> when the record company asked me to redo that song, um, I really went crazy on the vocal ability. Like if you hear the beginning part with all the vocals in the beginning, that's all me. And, you know, the choruses are all me. The phrasing is all me. And it's all the stuff that Gary really enjoyed out of my vocals. Like even if you hear on, on only the strong survive, the first record we put out in the, in 92, you know, he really liked to capture my vocals with, you know, two part harmonies and, and, and all kinds of different techniques through the years that he learned. 
I just didn't think that he had a, the younger singer that could do those things. And that's where I come in. And I, and I kind of took a lot of the stuff he taught me and I just ran with it. Like in, and help me save me for myself. There's just, I mean, there's like, um, I don't know, there's probably about 12 of me singing in there and it's all layered upon layered. And, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to duplicate live, but <laughs> it's, it's that we did it. We just did it last night. It went over awesome. So, I mean, like I said, uh, we, we, uh, we have a knack of doing it. I got a, um, uh, my keyboard player that does some background vocals and there's some other background vocals that go on. So it's all really, really cool things, but we stick to the, the core of rock and roll. And several people have talked to me about, you know, what was the, the, the big thing about the, the differences? And, you know, Gary was a, a rock guitarist, but he also knew how to write great songs. Like you just said, Take It On The Run was, was like the power ballad. I mean, it was like the you know, but he had more of a guitar thing in her, but he, he knew how to write those songs. And like, help me save me for myself is the same way. I mean, it's, it's just got the certain touch there that just, I think everybody, and it means something. It's not just the old love song thing. There's a real personal meaning there that he never really talked about. But now after his passing, I think everybody really needs to listen, you know, cause he had a message out there, you know, and I think that's the thing. It helped me save me for myself. It's so hard to do it, but we need to try. You know, we need to ask people for help. The people, if you see the video, if you got a chance to see our video, um, it's it's about having kind of a dark thing going in the beginning, but at the end, you know, from love and your family and and asking for help, you can always get through it. You know, and that's the message I tried to portray in it. How did you so. decide on those particular recordings of his, the the guitar work, some of the vocal work? to choose those in particular for LA is mine for the whole album. Um, it just kind of flowed really good. Those were some of the ones that really stuck out when he was, when we were still working together. And so I wanted to put those out first. Now there might be more around the, around the corner, but I'm not going to say we'll just wait and see. <laughs> but the thing is there's, there's uh, th there is some definitely good stuff out there. And, and those were the ones that I thought were perfect for this time, especially with all the things that are happening in the world right now. And that's, one of the other songs that we did that Gary kind of worked on years ago was uh, uh, Never Give Up. And I wrote that song and I brought that to him and he loved the song. And we put that on the album, Never Give Up. And I wrote it kind of in the in the terms of, you know, not, never giving up on your dreams and, you know, the music business and everything else. And then it turned out with all this COVID stuff. So we kind of brought it to the forefront of, of the COVID thing. And we have that in the video. We have a short video with that. You know, it's it's all about positive. We're trying to turn this whole negative thing into a positive feel. And and Gary definitely was like that. I mean, Gary was the funnest guy to be around. And and that's why we're trying to do it. And, and that's, you know, that's it. What was something underrated about him or not not maybe as known unless you had unless you're able to work with him regularly in the studio like you did and associate with him regularly as you did? What's something that most people would not no, the fan wouldn't know about Gary Richrath. Well, you know, I guess people I've seen some people that's you now tried to talk about his guitar and his sound and everything else. And I think people that play with me cannot believe that that guy nowadays, you see these guys go out on stage and they have so much gear. I mean, it's ridiculous, all these pedals and everything else. Um, and people didn't believe me that all he did, his, his, his was a Marshall amp with a coily cord and a Les Paul. And the only effect that he ever used, sorry about the sirens in the background, the only effect that he ever had was a uh, Cry Baby Wah for Golden Country. So, mm -hmm. that, and that was it. But otherwise it was just a, a, a direct guitar and he could make that guitar sing and that's how he did it, you know? And he had all that feeling and spilled up inside him and he could just play and play and play and play. And it, it was amazing. It was just amazing. And yeah. that brought, it brought out a lot of me for being able to sing like that. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of inspiring you and the rest of the rest of Rich Rat 313 to do this album, all the songs that you wrote, there's a co-write in there as well. Uh, how did that drive your own songwriting for the remainder of these songs, the ones that he didn't have a hand in writing? Um, well, Dennis, Dennis Pockets is our guitarist and he grew up idolizing Gary Rich Rath. I mean, he totally idolized him. And um, he was, uh, he, he couldn't believe that he got the opportunity to play with this, this project that we're doing. And he's been working with me on and off for probably the past 
10 years just in different things. But this finally came together. He searched every video, everything that Gary ever did with my helping him, telling him certain stories about how he plays and blah, blah, blah. And he just he just knocked it out of the park. Like last night, I mean, we did a show and he does a solo, you know, after a turkey trot. And he does all the things that Gary did, but he puts a little bit of his stuff in it, but he never strays from the Gary Richrath stuff. He, he is so into that. And the people, I mean, my gosh, they just love it. I mean, they just absolutely love it. And it's really neat to see that, that, you know, that it's unfortunate he's not here, but boy, we're just carrying that legacy on for him, you know? And, and, and again, like I said, it's just that you see the band live and you'll, you'll know, I mean, you know, Rich Rath Project 313 rocks and they, we do, you know, and, and everywhere we go, we have the same thing happening. It's getting better and better. It's the grassroots that Gary had back in the seventies. You'll just keep on following it, keep on playing as much as you can. And uh, that's where we're at right now. I mean, and the, and we have the the music to back it. So, which one of the songs from the album has gotten the best feedback that you can tell, either from live performance or hearing about a certain song online thus far? Well, we were just talking about Dennis, and he. I, I wrote a song, "Never Give Up," and he came up with this riff. And and uh, this song wasn't even going to be put on the album. And then all of a sudden, he came up with that riff. And he's got a, more of a. I'd hate to say it, but maybe more of a, a Van Halen kind of riff to it, mm. but I have the style of the Rich Rat thing. And it just all of a sudden, like, I got a song for that riff. We got to do this. And we, next thing you know, five days later, we were in the studio recording it. And it's, and that people can sing along to the, the chorus so easy because it's a song about everybody. You know, I say it's a song about you and me because it's a song about driving in the car with the top rolled down or the windows rolled down, cranking the music in the summertime, listening to your favorite you know, song when you're with your favorite girl or whatever, and just having a blast. And, and that's what it's all about. It's about fun. And that's what Gary was all about, just having too much fun. And, um, you know, so I, I don't know where else to say about that. But, you know, we had so many different ideas. And it just was like, I was getting bombarded. So I kind of had to like, you know, let's just take it easy and see what we got here, because we got so many songs. It's unbelievable. You know, and like I said, there might be more coming up, but I I won't tell you about that till they happen. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a little bit of an element of surprise there. How did right. you how did you know what to reference? Like, were these on either? It's kind of a two pronged question, but were they on like DATs or CDs or were they in files and computer? I, you could easily. How did that how did that part work? Uh, uh, the truth is I had everything on tape. And uh, and what I needed to do is I have an engineer that's a really, really super cool engineer. That's a friend of mine. And we took the tapes, we put them down to uh, um, the digital files so we could bring out with Pro Tools. And then we brought all the, the guitars up and, and whatever we needed to do that way. And then the band learned the songs and kept playing over the songs and you know rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. Then we went in and we played along with Gary. So Gary was actually in the studio when we played the, the recordings. And then they re-recorded that version of it. And then all Gary's guitar was the same guitars that were on there. So, you know, nowadays you can do so much technology stuff. It's crazy. But I mean, back in the day, you know, Gary was a tape guy. He loved, you know, the tape stuff. And that's what he did. And, you know, you could, you know, bounce stuff off here and there and, and do use a multi-track and then bounce it down to two tracks. And that's how we did stuff back in those days. But it's like now it's just everything's so easy to do digitally but you got to have the right song there and the right sound there so that's yeah, what we did good point um so did you know of certain songs going back i mean or maybe i should ask because I, I think you already kind of answered them there's some that you, you knew to do but were there some where you're digitizing and you go wow we need to try that one i forgot about that or didn't even realize it how much of it was already ingrained knowledge and how much of it was discovery through the digitization um I would say that pretty much everything was in my head, like while I wanted to do it, but it was that the chore was to try to get it to, to redo it, you know? And it was like, it was like, okay, this is what I had idea. But as we went along, like, especially like with the vocal things, I, I had multiple opportunities just to keep stacking vocals because that's, that's how you can do it nowadays. I mean, you could do it on tape too, but you know, we had the, the it's so much easier using a pro tools or something like that in a modern day studio. So that's how we did it. And, and it's like, you know, I can do a lot and I'm pretty strong at my vocal ability. So I had unlimited channels. I could do whatever I wanted to do, but to capture the raw stuff that Gary had was, was, 
it was there. We just had to redo it. You know, I mean, we just had to put it on digital format so we could play along with it. And that's the thing that's so cool. I mean, I had that idea from from when I saw Nat King Cole's daughter do that song. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I ca- that was where I got the idea from originally. And and then I said, yeah, we could do that. I think we could do it. And we did. And that's where it came from, actually. I mean, that not them, but that's where the idea came into my head. I didn't think it was going to be possible at first, but this was years ago. And then, you know, when they came to me and said, hey, we could do this. And so I took it under my wing to go talk to my engineer. And he said, not a problem, Mike, we can do it. You know, so that's oh, how it ended up coming about. Really cool. What is, I'm sure you've been asked this question a million times, but but what's your favorite Gary Retreth solo from Ario Speedwagon? And what is your favorite Ario Speedwagon song? Well, the um, that's kind of like a that one of those questions. I mean, there's so many of them. But when I grew up, <laughs> I, I grew up listening to You Get What You Play For. And Like You Do was like one of my early songs. And I just did an interview earlier that I was talking about the, kind of the same thing. But Like You Do is probably one of my favorite songs that Gary wrote. My, his fav- my favorite solo that I think he did was like something in Golden Country. But I mean, he was he... I enjoy sometimes when we do, we do Kevin songs too, which is really cool. Cause I, I enjoy, Kevin was a great songwriter and I love singing some of the stuff that he does. And, you know, it always brings out the other side of the, the, the crowd there, you know? And, and so we do it all, you know, and it's like, can't fight this feeling is, is a great song to sing. But Gary told me on that song, when they recorded that, he felt like he really, really busted his butt, you know, to make that song that certain the way he makes the guitar around the vocals it was so difficult. And he said, but it was really something that was a challenge to him. And I remember when mm. I first started playing with him, he said, listen to it, listen to it. So I did. And I really thought that was cool for Gary stuff. But I just know he rocked out more in in, um, in Golden Country. And then now the one that you were asking me about was the another favorite song. I was just asked a question about a song that was done on the on the live album that you get what you play for, um, Being Kind. And it was a guitar. I mean, it was it was Kevin's song. And it was, you know, Gary played along. And that was another song I really liked a lot. And um, I might even think about redoing that now. I mean, playing it live. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so that, but that was one of those songs that was fun to play. I mean, fun fun to listen to when I was a kid. But I, I've never even heard REO play it. So I don't know, you know. Again, I, my age difference is a little bit, bit, little bit lower than theirs. So <laughs> I don't know. But um, I was a kid when they started. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting old now, though. Yeah, well, it's still the time to bring it. You still got time yeah. to bring it to a live audience, so that that all works out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was listening to one of your other interviews, and you were talking. To, this isn't about about Gary or Ario, but about '80s era Los Angeles, and you were talking about about going to the Sunset Strip and the and the movie that was made about that whole scene. Have you read uh, the book that came out a few months ago? Nothing but a good time. The story of LA no. hair metal. It's it, it. That was my kind I, of. It, oh, go ahead. Somebody. Met- Somebody mentioned to me about that, but I haven't been able to. I I just remember like the the metal years and and some of the things that came out like in the late eighties, early nineties, and there were some some cool things. And like even like when you see, um, not to get off track, but when you saw the Doors, the Doors when they redid the Doors, the movie, you know, with Val mm-hmm. Kilmer. Yeah. I mean, it was so weird because I was so much later in the I was in the eighties there, but that same vibe it was still there in, in Hollywood. It's cool. Except you don't want to stay there forever. You probably won't make it out. But, you know, I mean, we were there for a short time. But, but man, it's, it is, it's a, an experience of a lifetime to be part of that, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm thankful I'm not there anymore. <laughs> I still love <laughs> Thousand Oaks. I go there all the time, like my second home. But that's outside the, the, the downtown area, the, uh, the Hollywood place, you know? It's a so. wee bit different. Yeah, just, just a touch. Um, but I mentioned the book because when you were talking about like posters and such and what, that is like a whole chapter in that book. It's an oral history. Yes. They got a whole bunch of people, like fairly big names. They didn't get like John Bon Jovi or Axl Rose, but they got like almost everyone else. And I'm reading through, it's, right. like, five, it's like 500 pages long. Um, I, I As you were talking about that in that other interview, I went... Yes, Whoa. I remember that now. Yes, yeah. yes. That's I I you having actually been there, I was fascinated reading that going, oh my gosh. So well, what you did, what you had to do is like, for instance, we used to play Gazaris all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's and, and Gary actually Gary actually came and played with us at Gazaris and the Roxy. And uh, you know, if you played any of those places at the time in the and the whiskey go go, you'd get like there'd be four bands or five bands play there, 
And then you'd have to buy tickets to get your slot. Mm-hmm. And the, the little amount of tickets you'd, you'd get on the first slot and then you'd have to buy more, get the second slot and then the third slot. And then, you know, like you, everybody would come see the band, but to get the people to come see you, you'd have to have a really good staple gun and a flyer. <laughs> yes. And you'd, yes. go to, you'd go to get copies of flyers and you'd go around every, every pole, you know, wooden pole that was up around anywhere, you know, telephone poles, whatever. You'd have to nail those poles. And it was amazing. It's like, and that's how people advertised back then, you know, because you couldn't get on the radio, but you could do stuff like that. I mean, there was very, very few people that ever did it. And, you know, the chances of making it were so slim, but it was still an opportunity to go out there and do it, you know, and, yeah. and, and uh, we, that's what we did. And and then we, we went the opposite when we met Gary. So it was kind of <laughs> But uh, it was it was really fun. It was a fun time. Yeah, I, I can only imagine what it would have been like to actually be there. And you were there. That's uh, yeah, it's what we were describing. This the reason I started laughing at some of that, because I went, yeah, that's exactly what was being described almost to a T. So, the, sure. yeah, there were a whole lot of people doing the exact same thing, putting posters on posters, going way yes. up as high as they could get. Like, yeah, I remember one time. I remember one time there was a band going around ripping down other posters and they put up a big thing. That's not nice to do to other bands. Don't do it. You would, it was a big thing because everybody would rip down the posters and they'll put their posters on top. It was, it was just a game, you know, and it was like, actually, I don't know how much that really did advertising wise, but I mean, most of the people sold their tickets and then the people showed up to see them, right. you know, but exactly. it was like, that. that's what it was. And you know what? We were originally from the Midwest. So a lot of people liked us because we weren't trying to play the same game as all the other people. Like there was a lot of guys that went out there just dressing the part and doing the part for the glam bands. Cause that's what was in the eighties, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, we actually played our instruments, you know, <laughs> right. so we were, we actually came from a band that was doing a lot of rush mm-hmm. and we went out there. Yeah. And, and so when you get people like, kind of just like, oh, okay, it's another original, another original, we throw in a rush song. And then people went nuts over that because nobody could play that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> especially back in those days, you know, right, but uh, yeah. it was it, it was a, it was a fun time. Well, and speaking of, of tickets, so you're selling tickets, going around, performing at places up here in the upper Midwest, at least as of right now. You're also from Wisconsin, as am I. Um, how one of my last questions here is how much I, I don't, I don't want to say how much REO Speedwagon fandom, but for that music, that era where does it kind of rank among other bands of that era? It sure seems I just the vibe I get here. And I've, I've all lived almost my whole life in Western Wisconsin, but similar vibe, I think to what's down in Southeastern Wisconsin, where you're from and where you're based originally. Um, what would you say? I mean, are they one of the most popular bands of that music of that era? How, what would you tell from performing around as much as you have? Um, well, I just think everybody, Everybody knows who they are. I think. I think, in the majority of the people know who they are. But it's still you. You still have to get the hits out there to to have people realize who they are. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times you talk to younger kids, you say, "Yeah, you know, Ario Speedway," and they say, "Who?" And it's like, so it's. I understand that because it's such a different age gap. But now, even like us going out there and doing what we're doing, you gotta. We have a younger vibe of people coming out because they want to hear new stuff. And that's, I think, is one of the, the issues. There's no new stuff coming out of REO Speedway. I mean, we have new stuff and we do old stuff and we do everything. And, you know, we even throw in, you know, at the end of the night, we'll do a Steppenwolf song. But we're still trying to do as much different things as possible to keep everybody interested, you know. And, uh, and, and there's talks about doing another single, like uh, hopefully during the Halloween thing, you know, and uh, – just a, just off the wall kind of thing, you know, just to keep things going, keep things fresh that, you know, our, our website and our Facebook pages and everything, the social media is what's making the bands. So, I mean, if you don't have any social media, that's, that's relevant. So we got to keep on thinking of new stuff all the time, which I don't know how to do, but I have people that do that. <laughs> so it's, it's very difficult, you know? but uh, it's not the same thing as in the eighties and nineties. I'll tell you that. So Still go to at least the word is getting out some way somehow, and we have the new music like you referenced. "L.A. Is Mine" is the album. Yeah, just, I mean, yes. Oh, yeah. no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say we've been getting some really, really great turnouts at the shows, and and again, it's it's uh, people really want they miss Gary, mm-hmm. uh, and then we're 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 pulling through on the end of the music end of it because they're happy, they're they're loving it. I mean, there's people that have tears in their eyes because they miss Gary so bad, and that's really mm-hmm. cool, you know. Especially when we do some of the older stuff, because we mm-hmm. do it to a T, you know. 
it, and it sounds really good. So thanks for doing what you do and keeping the spirit alive. Listen to the new album. Again, it's already out as of August 6th. Michael Jans, thanks for taking some time on the road uh, to, to chat with us on the tour bus. Yes. Great, greatly appreciated. Best of luck as you continue touring and with all the more further music creation going down the road. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me and uh, look forward to meeting you soon. Sounds good. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.